I'm Cheyenne Daniels, race and politics reporter for The Hill, and welcome to our event this evening called All In, Building a Diverse, Equitable, and Inclusive Energy Workforce. I want to give a special thank you to our sponsor for this evening, Southern Company, um, for helping support this dis dis discussion tonight. So thank you so much, Southern Company. As the United States prepares for the energy transition, a renewed focus has now been placed on workforce diversity in the energy industry. The energy sector itself is booming with millions, possibly even billions, in new investments and job growth opportunities. But black and Latino workers remain underrepresented in clean energy versus the rest of the economy, according to a new report by the Department of Energy. Black workers make up only about 9% of the clean energy workforce, despite making up 13% of the nation's workforce. And women represent less than 30% of the sector's workforce, despite accounting for nearly half of the overall US labor workforce. It doesn't stop there, because now we gotta talk about these young people, those whippersnappers out there. So the energy workforce itself is trending younger, but turnover is highest among those who are 23 to 37 years old, according to the Center for Energy Workforce Development. So these are a lot of numbers, I know, but the bigger questions that we have right now are what can companies in the energy sector do to focus on inclusion and retention of younger employees, women, and underrepresented ethnic and minority groups? What role should the government play in enacting policy solutions to build more equitable workplaces? And how can our community stay engaged and participate in these efforts? So these are all the topics that I am so excited we're gonna be able to cover this evening. Um, but before we get underway, I do wanna give just a few quick housekeeping notes. Please, please keep your phones on silent during the entire program, but please feel free to join in the conversation on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, um, and social media, including Instagram, at The Hill Events, using the hashtag The Hill DEI. That's all my housekeeping notes. Um, but I am so excited now to welcome Joe Ruffalo, The Hill's SVP and general manager, to the stage for a conversation with our sponsor, Southern Company. Um, he will be speaking with Chris Wilmack, Southern Company president. Welcome, Joe and Chris. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's great to uh, meet you. Know, you. It's, my, it's my pleasure. Uh, let's just jump right in. Is the energy well, first of all, let me say Please. thanks to Congressman Clyburn. I mean, my dear Absolutely. friend, it's uh, having the opportunity to be in his midst and his presence is always an honor, except for when I'm on the golf course with him. <laughs> <laughs> that is not necessarily an honor. It's a, it's a whipping. Well, it's great to have you all here and no, appreciate your time. Let's just jump right in. Is the energy sector's workforce as diverse as it can be? I don't think there's any workforce that is as diverse as it can be. I think it's it's always got to be a this kind of aspirational goal that every organization, every institution must have that it's got to find a way to continue to diversify its 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 makeup. Because why? Because it makes us all better. I mean, we're all striving to to appreciate the wonderful differences that we all bring to any experience that we have. How do we make sure we're getting different perspectives? Uh, different experiences, different knowledge, different views, and so, no, I think everybody as a baseline has got to say that our, our, our ultimate objective is to make sure that we're continuing to increase diversity in all the things that we do. Uniquely in the, in the energy space, we're, we're at, I think, at, a, at an interesting time. And whether you listen to Elon Musk, whether you listen to Bill Gates, particularly in the power sector, there's this, this reality that we're gonna see power demands increase by by 40%, or some would say by four times, uh, by 2040. So there's this incredible need for power to keep these lights on, but as many of you participate in, in computing activities, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's quantum computing, whether it's all the GIS things that you do, all the, all the tick and all the stuff that you're doing, all that requires what? Requires power. And so as, as more and more of that takes place, we're seeing there's an incredibly increasing demand for power. 
And so we're seeing this all, all across our territory in terms of having to build more power plants, build more battery storage, build more solar, build more renewables to make sure we are keeping you reliable and resilient and safe, but also trying to make sure we balance it out to deal with affordability issues. So we're seeing this increase in demand. So we're going to be building more resources to, to meet this demand. And as we do that, yes, I've got to make sure and we've got to make sure that, first of all, we're telling you about the reality of what's happening in our industry, but also saying what does that mean from a workforce standpoint in terms of going to different places all across the country, where it's, whether it's historically black colleges and universities, whether it's just different parts of, of communities to make sure they understand what the opportunities are. So yeah, it's an, it's an aggressive strategy around recruiting, uh, not only in, in universities and college campuses and technical schools, but it's beginning around the fourth grade, just getting into the school systems at a much, much, much earlier, earlier fashion to say, this is what you can be, this is what you can do, and creating great excitement about it to say, okay, this is a place uh, that's pretty cool to be. I mean, working in the power business is pretty cool. And so come join us, be a part of this journey. So that's a lot of things that I think about as, as, I, as we deal with this conversation. How has your own professional background informed your decision-making around diversity? Oh, my heavens. I mean, and, and I, one of the reasons I was excited about to do this because I, my professional career started on the Hill. I mean, I started on the Hill in 1979 working for a guy named Leon Panetta. And I came out of school, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I loved politics, and I, I loved what politics was all about. And the thing I love about the Hill and how that Hill experience has shaped me was that every day you come to work, you're trying to change something. And, and, you, and, and so as you do that, whether it was law or not law, even if the, if the law was there, you're still working to change it. And so you do that, and then the other part of it was you, you also have to be a good teammate and work with people and learn to collaborate, learn to collaborate across different parties and different, you know, different, different issues, different people. And, and so a lot of those things, I think, have have fundamentally served me well today in terms of as I do the job today. These are, these are skills that, that I learned when I was working on the Hill. I was also fortunate and blessed. Uh, Panetta's office was right next to Bill Gray's office. And so I got to spend time with Bill Gray at a, at a very formative early stage in my life. And so listening to guys like that, like Leon and, 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 and Bill Gray and Julian Dixon and Mickey Leland, who became a dear friend of mine, and, and Harold Ford, some of those people, I mean, they were great inspirations to me about, you know, the sky was the limit in terms of what I could do. Now, I never thought I would end up being the CEO of the, as we say, the largest power company in the country. And there's one who may be a little bit bigger, but it's more of a renewal development organization than what we are. No, I never thought this was possible, but at the same time, I do think the things that you learn on the Hill, uh, there are no limits. Uh, they're, 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 nothing can hold you back uh, because you're adaptable, you're flexible, you're a quick study, you learn to do things uh, in many different ways. The other thing is the Hill teaches you how to work hard. I mean, because there's, there, there's nothing short of working 14, 15, 16 hours a day, and you learn how to do third shift work. I mean, you learn how to work. And so there's no substitute in no matter what you do for working. And so, uh, I mean, I outwork a lot of people. I mean, I, I just do, because we just work. And so, and then we build teams and, and we get results. And those are a lot of things how I think the early stages of my career, I think really informed me and kind of shaped me into, I think what has been a part of my, my 30 plus year career at Southern Company. Speaking of the Hill, what, what are you looking for Congress to do to improve the diversity in the energy workforce? Congress got to do what Congress got to do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, mean I, I think, I mean, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, I look at the Congressional Black Caucus today and the numbers now that have, that have grown since my, my days on the Hill in, 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 the, in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and you look at just the overall diversity uh, from, from Latinos to, to women to African Americans to, to other, other ethnic groups. I mean, it's just greater diversity there than, than it was, in, and it continues to grow. I mean, I, you look at cases of, of, of 
you know, redistricting and, and how the voting rights is being used to make sure there's proper representation. So I think all that helps support from, from a policy standpoint, but also more importantly, I think in many places, like I grew up in South Alabama, so Alabama has, I guess for the past couple of decades, has only had one, one African-American member of Congress. Now they're being challenged to draw a district that would be conducive for a second member. And so I think that, that aspires kids to say, I can go do that. I mean, they see role models other than what they otherwise traditionally would see. So I think inherently, as you see uh, the diversification of, of Congress, I think that will then also flow down to policies and, and other institutions as well, because Congress will be le leading by, by example. And what has Southern Company specifically done to, to make its workforce more diverse? Uh, we've done a lot of things. I mean, it's, 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 it's been a long-term commitment for this company. Like I said, I've been there some 30 plus years. And so uh, diversity, I mean, we've been dealing with these issues before it was cool, cool and fashionable. I mean, so this has been something we've been, we've been on this journey for a very, very long time. Yes, like many other institutions and organizations, we kind of redoubled, even restructured our, our focus after the killing of George Floyd. Uh, and to, to make sure that the, work, that the work that we were doing, our commitment was not being viewed as episodic and that it was not something that we're just going to do kind of two or three months after the death of killing of George Floyd, but it'd be something that we'll continue to do for now and forevermore. And so we put a structure in place that says our aspiration was moving to equity uh, for everybody. And so, but the fundamental, the foundation of that was making sure we were listening and talking to each other and, and understanding each other. I, one of the stories I tell was that as, as we began to talk and there was one group of, of individuals, some, some African-American females were talking with some of their white colleagues and they were sharing the example of, of kind of the, what mothers say to their black sons as they, as they get of driving age and, and they would talk about driving while black. And many of the white colleagues had no idea what that meant. And some of you, I, I'm sure most of you get it. Driving while black means you pull over by the cops. You don't talk, you don't do anything, you put your hands on the, you know, on the dashboard and, and just listen. And so, so many people didn't understand that reality. So we start with talking and listening and reflecting and, and, and having those stories. And then that would inform us about the work we needed to do. Whether it's more, more talent recruiting, whether it was more, I mean, uh, redacting resumes where people couldn't tell your, your gender, your race, your ethnicity. Uh, a lot of different things uh, that we focused on. Things like uh, Propel Center, which we're developing with historically white colleges in terms of creating this, this kind of connectivity uh, to for, for, for science, technology, energy, and math, engineering and math work to make sure they have the best resources to, to fill jobs that are available in data science and data analytics and that kind of work. Uh, making sure we're doing things in our communities around social justice, energy justice, and being very intentional and being very committed about those things. And then measuring the work that we do and, and then understanding the gaps and then we start that all over again in the next year. But making sure that we're committed to do that work over the long haul is not just some episodic adventure that we're on, but we're on this long-term journey. You talked a little bit about this, but besides your own workforce, what are you doing for the different communities you serve? Oh, my heavens. I mean, where do you start? I mean, if, if, you, if you know anything about our company, our motto is we're a citizen whoever we serve. And our, our goal is to make sure that our communities are better because we live and work there. And so we are so dedicated. We're so integral to all the communities that we're involved in in terms of understanding their needs, making sure they're prepared for economic development, working with all the school systems, uh, but also doing things like working in distressed communities. If you ever watch the, the Tour Championship, and we've been involved with the PGA Tour now for probably over 25 years, and, it, and there's this community called Eastlake where the tournaments take, take place. And so this community some 25 years ago had the highest crime rate zip code in the country and had the lowest graduation rate in the, in the state of Georgia. Now 99.7% of the students graduate uh, 
the, there's incredible housing appreciation. There, there are grocery stores there now. There are banks there now. There are all the things you want in a thriving, thriving community. And because of the small investment we made, and we levered that with a bunch of other, other, other organizations, other institutions, and so lives have been saved because of that kind of work. We replicate that kind of focus all, all across our territories. And like I said, I mean, whether it's co-chairing homeless initiatives to make sure that we're really addressing the, the homeless needs in a given community and not just driving by a homeless person and trying to figure out, do I, do I give them money or do I not? And trying to understand why they may be homeless, but let's make sure we get our hands dirty and understand what all the issues are. And we're doing things to address those issues from additional affordable housing to what we call a continuum of care, making sure they've got resources to deal with their issues, bringing in the Veterans Administration to make sure that many of those those homeless individuals are veterans, making sure they're getting the kind of support they need. So it's a wide range of things that that we get involved in, and not just the commercial metro chamber activities, but doing the hard work, doing, doing the tough work, uh, doing the dirty work to make sure that all parts of our community are benefiting because we're there. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time, your insights, the work you're doing, and for being My here pleasure. tonight. My pleasure, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.